Please stand for the reading of God's word. Micah 5, 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, but thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is, to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been of, from old, from everlasting. Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth, and the remnant of his children shall return to the children of Israel. Matthew 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered together all the chief priests and scribes and people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least of, are, are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So here we see, even, even hundreds of years after the book of Micah was written, it was still in the minds of the leaders of Israel that that's where the Messiah would be born, in Bethlehem. Even the wise men knew the time. So everybody, please turn to 141, the little town of Bethlehem. Oh, <laughs> 
appreciate it and uh, give me the receipt and I'll make sure you get paid back. Thank you. Well, Merry Christmas. Christmas messages here. Today we're going to continue our study uh, about seeing the birth of Jesus as the most, what I consider to be, the most incredible, the most amazing, the most intriguing, the most unprecedented, the most extraordinary, and the most astonishing birth in human history. Could you add any accolades to that? Anybody got any that we should throw out? Finally. Finally. I, I, 
Timely. Timely, yes, timely, yes. That's a good one. Speaking of timely, let's go to slide two. <laughs> Remember the words of David Jeremiah. We're so used to Christmas that we have become dazed by the season instead of amazed by the reason. I like what he said. I, I've always been impressed with that statement from him. Slide three, please, Lauren. Just a quick look here. Today we're going to try to move from dazed to amazed. That's my job, is to get you to move from being dazed to amazed. Uh, by continuing a two-part series here that we're going to call New Beginnings and New Commitments. Uh, remember to be preparing for part two. I sent out an email to everyone uh, uh, on the New Commitments part by reading through Nehemiah chapters 8 through 13 and looking into the life of George Mueller. And I put some specific references in that email for the Nehemiah part and a link to the George Mueller uh, life right there that I enjoyed reading. It has a lot of good data on George. Both these men depended upon God for everything. And uh, we've got to do the same. So share with me what you learn when you're going through your studies. Uh, Herb already has sent me some data, and I'm going to try and include that in our studies. Slide four, please, Lauren. For today we're gonna, here's where we're at, the supremacy of Christ. The true believer in Jesus Christ all around the world, I think particularly during this season, uh, this story of Christ's birth is fascinating and, and I think it's awe-inspiring. Uh, and, and this time of year it's called specifically to attention. Christians should know that the story of Christmas isn't just about a baby in the manger. The story of Christmas is about who that baby was. And who was that baby? God. God. That's right. I consider this to be really, honestly, the most cru crucial issue in history for every individual. Who was that baby in the manger on that first Christmas morning? And uh, Greg got it right. It is God in the flesh. Next slide, please, Lauren. We looked heavily at these verses last week, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but Matt 121 says, And she, and the she there, of course, is Mary, shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. So the angel told Joseph what God the Father would name his son. Because this is his son, not Joseph's. For he shall save his people from their sin. So the angel also told Joseph here why Jesus came. Not just that he's coming, and not just what his name should be, but he told him why he was coming, and that was to save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now, last week, next slide, please, Lauren, sorry. We, we saw some names of Jesus emerge as we looked at this. Jesus means what? Savior. Savior, right. Emmanuel. God with us. God with us. How about Son of Man? That tells us that Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, was fully human. That's what that tells us, Son of Man. Son of the Highest, and he's called the Son of God. All three, Son of Man, Son of the Highest, and Son of God. All three refer to Jesus Christ. So Colossians 2 makes this, uh, what I consider to be a, a sweeping and a profound statement, uh, that the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in Jesus Christ. Colossians 2, 9, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So the body is the container. The body is the container for the soul, right? Our spirit is, is held within this container. When that baby in the manger was born, what was in that container? God. Yes, that's what we're told here. It is God, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And that's important to remember. God took on human form, right? And verse 10 says, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So Jesus Christ is everything he was as God 
But now he's in a human body, which is that baby in the manger. Slide seven, please, Lauren. So let's look at uh, a verse that has been the cause of a lot of debate over the years about the birth of Jesus Christ, and that is Philippians chapter 2, and I'm going to start in verse 7. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7. It says, but, and this is talking about Jesus, Jesus made himself of no reputation. How does that make you feel about what you are? He took on human flesh. He became one of us. What does that mean about us? We have no reputation because we did not make ourselves. We were created and took upon him the form of a servant. So what does that tell you about you? We are servants. And he was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So to make himself of no reputation means to be made empty. Some have taken this to mean that when he became that babe in the manger, by taking on a human body, he emptied himself of what, we, what he was as God for that time. That is not true. That is not true. This was God in the flesh. He remained all that he ever was as God when he became that babe in the manger, but he changed his mode of being. He was no longer God in heaven sitting on the throne. He was God among us, as Emmanuel tells us, the name Emmanuel. He just happened now to be in a different mode. Now he is encapsulated in a human body. So if he didn't take on a human body, what could he not do? He could not, could die. not die. Could not could die. He couldn't die. So in taking, I see that hand. He couldn't be an example. He couldn't live the law. Right? He couldn't live the law perfectly. Yes. He could not live a sinless life. Mm -hmm. And wasn't that critical to his death? Yes. When he died as the perfect sacrifice, if he had, you two guys nailed it, uh, if he hadn't done what he did, he would not have been a fit sacrifice, would he? No, but taking on a body allowed him to do that. He could die, and that was the only acceptable sacrifice or payment for our sins. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this phrase is funny to me because it says that though he was rich, yet he for your sakes became poor, gave everything he up in heaven without giving up who he was as God. He walked away from the throne, the, all that stuff. He became poor. That you through his poverty might be made rich. What an amazing statement. I, I, I said, he was rich, but purposely became poor so that we might be rich. Yes, sir? All these verses also have the idea that Jesus existed before. Yes. Yes. He was uh, pre-existent in eternity past. Yeah. I thought you were going to say something like, maybe husbands understand this verse because we were rich. We got married and became ah. poor so that someone else might be rich. So we... <laughs> Can you say amen, guys? Amen. Yeah. 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 See? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. The ladies say it too. <laughs> yeah. That's what he did for us. He became poor so that we might become rich. And then somehow he finds his riches in us. I, says, I don't consider myself much of a catch, but that's what he did. Jesus Christ, without doubt, without reservation, without excuse, and without any other options, is God in human flesh. He just simply walked away from his throne and changed his mode of being. Now he is in a human body. Uh, and this makes the true identity of Jesus Christ, that babe in the manger, to be God in the flesh. Okay, next slide, please, Lauren. God came to earth by taking on a human body for this specific purpose, to seek and to save that which was lost. Right? To seek and to save that which was lost. We could not find our way. The fog of life, too thick for us to see through. So as an act of love for us, 
really love for us. Jesus was born in a manger to save us from being lost. To And when you look up that word, it means disastrous, devastating, catastrophic, dreadful, terrible, total destruction. That's what it means. All the um, accolades I could add, that was my list. That's what the word means. He knew what we had ahead of us, didn't want us to go there, so Cain took on flesh that he might die for us. Slide nine, please, Lori. Last week we looked at the, well, all these things. We looked at the incredible circumstances surrounding the birth of Jesus. There's the amazing appearance of the angel Gabriel uh, to Mary to announce that she would bear God's son. There's the intriguing interaction between Mary and Elizabeth with a spirit-inspired response from the unborn John the Baptist as Mary sought confirmation of Gabriel's news. Then there's the unprecedented account of the angel's nighttime appearance to the shepherds right after Jesus is born in Luke chapter 2. Then there's the um, uh, extraordinary mission of the wise men. We didn't really look at that last week, but it's extraordinary in Matthew chapter 2. And then Simeon's astonishing spirit-filled pronouncement at the temple in Luke chapter 2. All of this surrounding the birth of Christ. But there is one other crowning passage uh, among all those that provides godly insight, I think, into who is in that manger. And that's what I want to call your attention today. My all-time favorite chapter in the Bible, and it is my all-time favorite chapter about the birth of Christ. And that is Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, where God declares the wonderful truth that Jesus Christ's preeminence and superiority has always been, as Joseph pointed out, and in that chapter, it's in almost every verse. In this chapter, God speaks of Jesus inheriting all things, his work in creation, his essential nature as God, his atoning death for sinners, and his superiority over the angels. And that's where what Joseph said came in. Like I say, the entire chapter, effectively, it, it proclaims Jesus, uh, the Messiah's true identity and his rightful position. Uh, next slide, please, Lauren. Slide 10. Just a brief history of the book of Hebrews. If you had to put it in a phrase, what would it be? The whole book of Hebrews can be sized up in three words. What are they? Jesus is better. <laughs> Seriously, you guys are geniuses. I love it. Jesus is better. He's talking about the law, works, all the, the, the Mosaic covenant, that kind of stuff throughout. It's a book written to the Jews and the Jewish believers. And, uh, and, and, and the author is telling them that Jesus is better. The letter to the Hebrews was written about 68 AD, give or take a year to either side, and it was obviously, as you read it, written to Jewish Christians who would relish the book far more than the Gentiles could. So a lot of that stuff we don't get, because we weren't raised in the Hebrew faith, we didn't saw that side, so we have to study it and learn it to get into it. Its purpose, I think, is to show that Jesus Christ is, in fact, the fulfillment of of the Old Testament messianic promises, the pictures, the types, the representations, and the shadows that preceded him. He is the fulfillment of that. And that's what the book of Hebrews is about. That's what Jose talked about uh, last Wednesday night, is the picture of things to come. So the book assures believing Jews that their faith was correctly placed. And it also, I think, encourages unbelieving Jews that Embracing Jesus is the right commitment to make. Next slide, please, Lauren. We've mentioned our rapture kits, and we've got to start putting those together. We could market these that people put on their mantle. Because in the rapture, you won't be here anymore. You won't be here. Granny and I will be gone. Thanks to the grace of God and putting our faith in Jesus Christ, he has uh, guaranteed us in his word that he is going to carry us home. So then our, our home will be uh, empty except for Batman and Nellie. Well, Batman may come. Nellie's not making the cut. <laughs> and there it'll be. So then somebody is going to move in. 
somebody will. In that disastrous time of Daniel's 70th week, people were, will be just trying to survive. Our home will become someone else's home. Okay, so I believe the book of Hebrews was written to the Jews at that time, specifically at that time, so that they would find themselves to Jesus Christ while they have found themselves in the midst of Daniel's 70th week. And I think this text is going to be a key part of the evangelistic effort that's presented during that terrible time. The 144,000 and the two and anybody that gets saved that's preaching the gospel, I believe is going to use Hebrews chapter 1 and the rest of the book as their primary witnessing tool to the Jews. That's what I, just my personal opinion. A copy of it should be in a rapture kit uh, that you leave on your mantle for anyone who moves into your house after you're gone. And then instructions on how to stay away from Nellie. So that's what we'll need. So, <laughs> amen, Herb? Yeah. Uh, she, she, yeah, it's her, Nellie is Nellie. So the writer of Hebrews confirms that the uh, babe born in the Bethlehem manger is the Messiah, and that he is truly Lord of a new covenant, which is far superior to the old covenant of Moses, the works covenant. Now we talk about the covenant of grace. Next slide, please, Lauren. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 here, tell us the, the, the purpose of the book of Hebrews. I like that. I like a purpose statement right up front. And the author of Hebrews, which I personally think was Paul, but we don't know that for sure, tells us the purpose of the book. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. These are wow verses. These knock us off our feet. In these verses, there is a description from who? from God regarding who that baby in Bethlehem really is. It's arguably the most concise and comprehensive New Testament summary statement of the identity and the superiority of Jesus Christ. I love these verses. These will be the, the first words read by whomever reads this book during the tribulation period. Put yourself in their mind just for a moment. The world has gone to soup. You guys are all gone. The rapture has occurred. Your house is empty. But people are roaming out over the prairie trying to find a place of security, a place of safety, and food, and water. And they'll find that in our house. It'll be there uh, waiting for them. And when they find the book of Hebrews, they open this, their Bible, and they see these verses, they'll see Jesus is the Christ right out of the gate. They may not need to read any other verses to know who Jesus is. Next slide, please, Lauren. Slide 13. So the writer includes three features that I think are there that I'd like to define for you this morning. First of all, point number one was the preparation for Christ. Uh, we have in, in, in the book of Hebrews, particularly in these verses, the planning, the provision, and the groundwork laid for his coming. Then we have point number two, the presentation of Christ. We have the appearances of Jesus, the God-man, speaking to us in person. Who was Jesus Christ? He was God in the flesh. He was Emmanuel. He was God that walked amongst us. I love what John says in 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. We touched him. We touched the very God of the ages because he was amongst us in a human wrapper, okay? And point number three is the preeminence of Christ. We have his superior, his domination, and excellence. All three there. So go to the next slide, please, Lauren. Point number one. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. 
God who at various, your old King James says sundry, it, uh, that means various uh, times, and in uh, divers manners, or in, that means various ways, spoke in time past to the fathers. Who were the fathers that we're talking about here? Who God spoken to? Let's, let's establish that first. Who is he talking about? Talking about the fathers by the prophets. Who did the Old Testament prophets speak to? Abraham, Moses, and David. Great. That's you awesome. Got a huh? You got a high line. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Abraham, Moses. Oh, it's up there. Oh, awesome. <laughs> that must have been a miracle. And, uh, and all of Israel. That's who we're talking about. He spoke to them by the prophets. So the Old Testament was simply God speaking to the Jewish people, which are the fathers, through the prophets in many different ways. And, uh, and at a number of different times, really. What was the main message? What was he telling them about? The future coming of Christ. Exactly. The suffering Messiah. Yeah, the Messiah. He was telling them about the suffering Messiah and also about the triumphant Messiah. But if you want to ignore the first and go to the second, which they did, you can get things mucked up. Okay? So the prophets were men who spoke for God, and they did so at various times and in various ways. Um, the, uh, the, the prophets were men who, uh, which actually, when it says at various times, that means in many portions. In the Hebrew, that means many portions. So what he's telling us here is that how many, how many books in the Old Testament, Bible students? How many books in the Old Testament? 39. Who said 39? Did you say 39? Oh, Kevin did. Awesome. That's a 10. Yeah, it means in many portions. And those portions became 39 books. That's what put together is the Old Testament. That's what the author of Hebrews is telling us. It didn't get all put together out of one mouth in one way at one time. It was the progressive gathering of the scriptures into a single Old Testament book, 39 books. The author goes on to say that God's servants received his words in various ways. That means different methods. Sometimes he spoke in um, an audible voice. How did that go over? They were scared. Yes, very scary. Very scary. In fact, the Israelites told Moses, "You will listen to him and just tell us what he said." So, at other times, he spoke to them indirectly, or he prompted in their minds the thoughts he wanted to convey. He also used types, symbols, ceremonies, and even stone tablets to communicate with men. Okay, but all of this was inspired. It was inerrant. And it truly is what God wanted written in the way he wanted it written. So that's what we've got together in the Old Testament. So the Old Testament story of the coming Messiah is actually based on a progressive revelation. And that is a, a fancy phrase when I say that, that describes the fact that God revealed to humanity his coming Messiah um, in bits and pieces throughout these prophets. His revelation was given in stages. It begins with the early rules and regulations under the law. Actually, Herb nailed the very first reference to the coming Messiah that clearly states about him is where? Herb brought it up in Sunday school. Genesis, Genesis 3, 3, 3, 15. 15. Genesis 3, 15. So each of you gets a 3.3 on the scorecard. That's awesome. Genesis 3.15 is the first clear reference that we have a Messiah coming. Okay, 3.15 and on. So the Jewish people were exposed, I think, to greater detail through the types and ceremonies, weren't they? They were told some things, and then they were told to enact these ceremonies and feasts. And what did that point to? Always pointed to Christ, didn't it? So as things grew, it was progressive. More and more and more evidence of the coming Messiah. And after that, the prophetic books, oh my goodness, uh, which took them to the next level in understanding God's redemptive plan. Who has an actual Bible here? Is that, Princess, is that an actual Bible? 
What's the version? Okay. All right. We'll count it as an actual Bible. Hold that up, okay? Hold that up. That is what? That is God's redemptive plan for man. Thank you. That's what that Bible is. The Bible, Old Testament tells of his coming. New Testament tells us that he did and what he did. This And, and why he came, of course, is to save our souls. The Bible in its entirety has a single theme, and that is the redemption of men's souls. That's what it's about. Whenever you study the Bible, just put that at the top of your page. God's redemptive plan for man. So then what do, the, what do these passages that you're studying have to do with his plan? And that'll keep you on course with good hermeneutics. Hard to screw that up. So we know that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, right? It is God breathed. Uh, he was, uh, when Paul wrote this, what was he referring to? All scripture, but what was written at that time? The Old Testament. The Old Testament. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Directly, he was referring to the Old Testament. Indirectly, he was already penning some of the things that would become the New Testament. So when Peter said, no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, he too was talking about the Old Testament. So the writer of Hebrews validated the authenticity of the Old Testament by showing us that it is about the preparation for Christ. Because he also knew uh, that its main focus was Jesus Christ. The Old Tes Testament focus is that baby in the manger. When you hold up your Bible, that's what you're talking about. So from Herb's verse, Genesis 3.15, which is the first allusion of Christ and the Gospel, to Malachi chapter 4. Uh, where that's a reference to Christ returning in judgment against the ungodly. So you kind of have bookends here in the Old Testament. The Lord Jesus is the subject all the way through the Old Testament. He's the one pictured in the sacrifices, isn't he? He's the one pictured in the ceremonies. And he's detailed throughout the, the five books of Moses. So he, he's the great prophet and king that was promised time and again. That's what we find in the book of the Old Testament. But, when you go back and look, I must say that there is not one single tells that whole story. It's put together across 39 books. Now, we get down to this verse, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, uh, of this salvation, and that's the first coming of Christ. The prophets have inquired and searched carefully. Now get this, okay? Just follow, follow with me on this verse. I know this is a little more technical, but these guys, these prophets of the Old Testament, they prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what, or what manner of time, what and now when, the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glories that would follow. First question I have for you based on those verses is what spirit moved those prophets to prophesy? The spirit of Christ. Christ. Whoa! But he wasn't born yet. Going back to what you said before, Joseph, he was, he was pre-existent to that time. He's always been. So, the Spirit of Christ moved upon these Old Testament prophets to prophesy of his coming. Now, when you look at that, did the Old Testament prophets figure out what that meant and when would it be? Did they figure that out? No, they didn't. Really, they didn't, but they were looking for it. They were poring over the scriptures, couldn't sort everything out, because the revelation was across 39 books, and you had to get all the pieces together. So they wondered exactly what they were writing about and precisely when everything would occur. They were the authors of this, and yet they were not given the understanding that we have today. I think that's amazing. And this sounds to me like a lot of us as we look to the scriptures for when will the rapture occur, right? We know it's coming, but we pour over the scriptures to figure out the, uh, if we can figure out at least generally when this will occur, because we'd like it to be tomorrow. Today. Today. Well, we have to get lunch yet. <laughs> After we go to Globe, all right. 
Guadalajara. Yeah, Guadalajara. Yeah. But I think this sounds a lot like New Testament Christians looking for his second coming. They're doing the same thing, just looking for his first coming. That's all. So slide 15, Lauren. We can conclude that the Old Testament's progressive revelation, as it went through 39 books, prepared its readers for the coming of Christ. But no one saw a complete picture of the Messiah until he actually came in the New Testament. And when he was born, you can bet those prophets, anybody who had, well, a lot of them were dead already. In fact, they were all dead already. But the students of their writings would go back and have their aha moment. Born in Bethlehem. Aha. I get it. Now, uh, and then after his death, you guys were amazing to me today in Sunday school as you belted out Psalm 2, Psalm 22, uh, Isaiah 53. Uh, what other scriptures did you guys? Genesis 3, Genesis 3 uh, about, the, about the coming of the Messiah. That's an amazing bed of knowledge that you worked from as we went through the Sunday school lesson. And uh, honestly, I was truly impressed. So the Old Testament is a progressive revelation that prepared its readers for the baby in the manger. Uh, next slide, please, Lauren. Then we've got point number two, the presentation of Christ. The presentation. Who was that uh, baby in the manger? Who did the shepherds find in the manger? The writer of Hebrews confirms that Christ, the one the shepherds found in the manger, is the full revelation of God when he says he has, in these last days, spoken to us by his Son. Take that phrase and digest it for just a moment and understand the magnitude and the magnificence of what we are told here. That means that when... Jesus Christ was speaking to man. This was God's voice they were hearing. It was God's voice they were hearing. An amazing passage. Just amazing to me. As in these last days, God spoke to us through his son. Through that human container that had God within it, he spoke. My goodness, so Christ revealed God to us fully because he was fully God. I like what Paul says in Colossians 2, 9. Are you ladies, have you done chapter 2? In Colossians? Yeah. I think we are towards the end of it. Chapter 2, verse 9. For in him, who's the him? Jesus. Jesus dwells all the fullness, and that means the complete package of the Godhead in a body. So what does that tell you? Think with me on this. Who was Jesus Christ? God. God. That's what Paul is telling us. Everything God was in heaven, everything. Philippians 2, 7 settles the argument there about what he left behind. He left nothing behind. The entire fullness of the Godhead, his power, his omniscience, all those things, uh, all knowledge was in Jesus Christ. The full complement of who God was is now in a body. So one of the shepherds found in that manger, when they found him there, they found God. I like that song, uh, Mary, Did You Know? You guys heard that song? Every once in a while it plays on the radio. Um, and it's a, I can't quote it at all, but I like the words to the song. It's a great song. We can see in Jesus Christ, which is the one the shepherds found in the manger, everything we need to know about God. Because the fullness of God was in that body. And that includes all his attributes, like I said. His omniscience, his miracle working power uh, over every aspect of creation. He could calm the winds. He could raise the dead. He did all those things. Jesus Christ did those things. Because he was the fullness of God in a human wrapper. Oh my goodness, I am in awe at what this tells me. And then that phrase, in the last days, is very powerful of our verse. And who is appointed, see, in these last days, spoken to us by his son. After Jesus was born, after he was born, God quit speaking as he had in the Old Testament. The prophets, the, that was done. 
Now he is presented to us in his full revelation through his son. If you got a guy running around today that says he's a prophet of God and I've got a word from God, be very suspicious. Because God speaks to us now through his son. And that is the word of God, the Bible. Jesus Christ, as the full expression of his father, that baby in the manger could say, John 14, 9. Do I, have, I don't have that verse up. He who has seen me has what? Seen the Father. Seen the Father. Yes, because he was the Father. The fullness of the Godhead was there. The Spirit, Jesus Christ, the Son, the Father, all encapsulated in this body. Next slide, please. Remember Joseph's visit by an angel. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to read all these verses but because uh, I'm running out of time. Can you imagine that? Uh, Matt 118. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Joseph is maybe the most amazing guy to me in the scriptures. Because then Joseph, her husband, he's a just man. And he's not wanting to make her a public example. He was minded to put her away secretly so that people wouldn't know what happened. He didn't want her to be embarrassed. I think there was true love speaking here. And he was a, he was a good man. Um, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, an angel, an angel appeared to him in a dream and, and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. To take Mary to your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. He's being told that he will not be the father of this baby. She is pregnant, but you won't be the father. Yes, sir? He's not saying that he's not the father. He's saying God's the father. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. Is that... Are you good? Yeah. Because, okay. Well, the reason I bring that up is because if you say, well, he's not the father... Well, no, I'm talking about yeah. Joseph. Joseph is not the father. Joseph is the subject of these verses, and he's the one being spoken to. And the angel is telling him, you are not the father. You won't be the father. And it's being made clear. Do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife. She's, and she will bring forth a son, not yours, not Joseph's. Right? And you, call, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. I think it's a biblical, particularly Jewish custom that the father has the right to pick the name of the child. The father has that right. And that's what you're seeing here. The father of that child is picking the name for the child. And he is saying, call him Jesus. The, message, the, the angel's the messenger. Not making this up himself. He's a messenger. That's what angels are. So he's coming from the father of that child. To tell the mother what the name of that child will be. Joseph, as the surrogate here, is going to make sure that that happens. I think he's an amazing guy. Verse 22, so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Again, we hearken back to the Old Testament to speak about the babe that's in the manger, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated what? God with us. Yes. So this is God with us. That human container contained the fullness of the Godhead. That baby in the manger. Slide 18, please, Lauren. Jesus is the physical expression that, that, that we can see and touch is what I mean. And the, the, the fulfillment of what God spoke about through the Old Testament prophet Isaiah where we see Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the, the Lord himself shall give you a sign, a sign that this is the Messiah. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Even in the Old Testament, the prophets, as they puzzle over Emmanuel, like God with us, you mean this virgin will become pregnant and bring forth a son and this will be done without a earthly father. 
and the container that is born will have God within it. That's what you would deduce from this verse. And it would be true, and that's what happened. They were told what was coming. Slide 19, please, Lauren. So we must conclude, as you look at the scriptures and as we've talked it through, that the one the shepherds found in the manger was who? God. God. God in the flesh. And in my mind, I know I keep saying in a human container, a human body, for me that's how I keep it all straight. This, this body is a container, and within this container is your soul and your spirit. And within that container, the body of the Lord Jesus as a baby in the manger, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in that container. Oh my goodness. Next slide please, Lauren. Point number three. Well, here we come to the preeminence of Christ. And this is where we'll spend the rest of our time, which is, where's Herb? Herb went over on men's meeting, causing us to go over on Sunday school, so I have extra minutes. The preeminence of Christ. To be preeminent, what does that mean? When I am preeminent. First, first in all things. First in importance first in honor, and first in worship. Okay, that's where Christ was. And now slide 21, please, Lord. Once the writer of Hebrews presented Jesus as God's son, he immediately gave us a sevenfold summary of the preeminence of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to just introduce those quick, and then we'll close, okay? If you go back to our opening verses, let me come down to... Uh, I don't know that I listed all seven on a separate slide, but um, help me pick these out, guys, because we're going to look at seven things next week. We'll do it next week. I concede the point. It's afternoon. That's, you give reverence to the clock. I, I guess so. I'll quit if you guys can pick out the seven things. Otherwise, we're going to keep going. All right, what's the first of the seven? As in these last days spoken to us by his son. Okay, that's his identity. Now, what are the sevenfold things you see in these verses that tell us about the preeminence of Jesus Christ? What's the first one? Pointed heir of all things. <clears throat> that's number one. Jesus Christ is preeminent. He is pointed heir of all things. What's the fascinating thing about that verse, that part? For me, it's the fact that we are appointed as joint heirs, which I don't know what that means. That's not up there. What's that? That's not up there. That's not up there, you're right, Lauren. <laughs> yeah, very valid point. Number one is he is appointed heir of all things. Number two, what's the number two? He who also made the world. He is the creator. He is preeminent because he is the creator. Number three, brightness the brightness of his glory. The brightness of his glory. He is the light of the world, isn't he? He is the light of the world. How about number four? The image of his person. What is that? The image of his person. He is the physical manifestation of God. Exactly. He is the physical manifestation of God. Okay, what's number five? Upholds all things by the word of his power. I can't help but think of Kevin anytime I read that phrase because we're talking about the creation of the universe. What is holding all this together? Is that two things? That's, no, it's just one. Just three. Up, he upholds all things, and that's one thing. Uh huh. And he is the manifestation of God's power, is the second thing. I guess we could expand it to that. Yeah, we could. We could have five and six there. Well, then there's eight things. Huh? Bonus minutes. Never mind. <laughs> Lauren, because you came up with an extra, that's a five-minute penalty. No, no, okay. Got away <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got five and six, right? Upholds all things, and he does it by the word of his power. All right? That's what holds this whole thing together. You take Jesus Christ out of this thing and it's done. Okay? Number seven then. 
He purged our sins. Purged our sins. And number eight. Yes, as preeminent. So, I'm going to go from seven to eight based on Lauren's input here. We have eight things in these two verses that show us the preeminence of Jesus Christ. First in all things. Awesome, right? Just awesome. Eight points on next week's outline. We're going to get it done, too. All right. What do you guys think? Amazing, isn't it? It's actually literally amazing as we look upon what God did. And, 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 and here, this is the very words of God as he is describing his son, Jesus Christ. He has eight things where he is absolutely preeminent. And those eight things cover everything. When you gave your heart and soul to the Lord Jesus Christ and got saved, you made the right decision. You made the right decision. Uh, I just, uh, I am in awe of Jesus Christ. Let me get down here because we're going to close now. Um, I guess slide 27. Yeah, next slide please, Lauren. Yeah, here's our, this was our original outline. Uh, we got down to, we did cover the preeminence of Christ, but the preparation for Christ I'm going to, Genesis 3.15, we'll call that the Herb verse, uh, which is the first allusion to Christ in the gospel, all the way to Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, which is a reference to Christ returning to judge the ungodly. The Lord Jesus Christ is the subject all the way through the Old Testament. So that was point number one, the preparation for Christ. Point number two was the presentation of Christ. And we looked at that from the perspective that he has, in these last days, God has spoken to us by his son. That baby they found in the manger was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then point number three, which we'll finish next week, is the, uh, the preeminence of Christ. And, and we'll complete that outline, like I said. I have a sevenfold outline, which is now going to be eight, which gives me an extra five minutes next Sunday. I thank you, Lauren. Uh, They'll thank you, too. <laughs> I love that thought. I got to say, if you've never trusted Christ, you see up here why you should in those eight features. Um, and I, it, if, if the Lord is dealing with your heart about the saving of your soul, don't walk away from that. Uh, just put your faith in him. That's all he's looking for. He doesn't want your works. He doesn't care about your looks. He doesn't care about any of that. He just wants you to put your faith in him. That's what he wants. Uh, in John 1, 12 and 13, he says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, believed his identity, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, that he walked this earth. He says he gave the right to become the children of God if we believe in his name. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. Born of God. That's what it means to put your faith in Christ. You are born again, as a child of the King. So please do that if you haven't. Any closing thoughts before we go? Okay, next Sunday, we will complete the first part of our series. By, uh, by going through the now eight points of Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, as they describe the preeminence of the baby in the manger. Okay, no closing thoughts? All right, let's see, do we have Dave out there? All right, it's okay, we'll start with Dave just in case we, we don't want to lose him on the, uh, on the rebound. And then we'll, we'll go to Joseph. Thank you, Joseph, for leading the songs service today. And uh, thank you, Claire, for the most uh, amazing job on the piano. I put a feeler out, by the way, for a, a uh, what do you call it? The one that sits out like and has legs. Um, baby grand. Baby, well, I didn't go for the phone. Oh. We ain't getting no baby grand. We're getting a grand. So 
There's a church in town, I hope, that has a spare. And uh, maybe we can snag it. Jose's on as well. Jose's on as well? Awesome. All right. So we got, let's start with uh, Dave, go to Jose, and we'll end with Joseph. How's that? Can you hear me? Yeah. Do you hear me? Yep. Gotcha. Gotcha, right. Dave. Our Heavenly Father, how good it is to uh, uh, contemplate and concentrate our thinking on your Son, the Lord Jesus, the one who came to be with us, who took on human form, was made in the image of, who being in the image of God was made, took to himself human form, uh, so that he might become our high priest, and so we read that we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, tried, like we are, yet without sin. And because of that, we can come boldly unto the throne of grace as we do right now, where we may obtain mercy and find grace to help at just the right time. What a wonderful provision for us this access into your throne room. It's an amazing thing. Thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray today. And Lord, I want to continue by thanking you for the marvelous message that we heard, that we continue to hear, that's there for everyone to see. It is a wonderful message to be able to carry into a world that needs to hear the gospel, uh, to hear the preeminence of Christ and the fulfillment of the promise of God from the very beginning. Uh, what an exciting uh, message we heard, Lord, and we continue to have the honor and privilege of bearing. Please, Lord, let it bear fruit as we bear it this season. In Jesus' name. Thank you, everybody.